What's up YouTube? It's me Jess and I'm an opera singer. Today's video is patron pick of the month and for this month they have chosen Sonata a Lagrimar performed by Natalie Stutzman and Philippe Jachowski. Let's go. literally was holding my breath light bulb went out she was also conducting what a boss move and wow i have not seen this video however i have heard of both singers and i have seen them on separate occasions not in person but i have seen them on on YouTube so it was really great to see the two of them come together for this piece my god we have so much to talk about 
and I don't think it's appropriate to do a video on this performance without talking about the actual opera. I think it's important. It gives so much context to what is going on. And it also will allow you to not only just appreciate the beautiful sounds that you're hearing, but also understand what happened right before this, why they are singing this, what motivated them to come to this moment here, and how they grow with characters based off of their actions. So let's get into this opera. Primo. The opera opens up in chorus and we see Giulio Cesare and his general Curio being approached by Cordelia and her son Sesto. They are begging and pleading to Cesare for some peace because Cesare and Pompeo, the husband and father of Cordelia and Sesto, are enemies. Cesare thinks it over, but agrees that the two of them can talk and hopefully come to some sort of peace agreement. Well, just in the nick of time, Aquila, the general to Ptolemeo, comes in and offers the king Cesare a gift. Cesare opens the gift to reveal a platter with Pompeo's head on it. This is all happening right in front of Cordelia and Sesto, who obviously break down. Giulio Cesare is angry. He tells Aquila that him and Ptolemeo do not have his respect, and they don't even deserve to have the titles that they have because it was not their duty to kill Pompeo. Aquila leaves. He then tells Aquila to go to Ptolemeo to tell him just how angry he is. Meanwhile, Sesto promises to avenge his father's death. In another part of the palace at Alexandra, home to Cleopatra, Cleopatra ponders how she can become the sole ruler of Egypt because she does not like to share power, especially not with her hot-headed brother Ptolemeo. While she is pondering, Nireno, her servant, interrupts her to let her know that Pompeo is dead and by the order of her brother Ptolemeo. A light goes off in Cleopatra and she realizes she can use this situation to her advantage. She thinks about how she can use Cesare's anger and seduce him into helping her become the sole ruler of Egypt. Next, Aquila approaches Ptolemeo to tell him that King Cesare did not receive their gift well, but is in fact irate. Seeing how much deep water the both of them are in, Aquila makes a proposition. He says that he can indeed kill Cesare only if he can have Cordelia as his wife. Ptolemeo thinks about how much power Cesare already has and how much potential power he is to gain should he continue to grow his nation. With this in mind, he agrees and allows Aquila to plan out how he is going to kill Cesare. The next scene shifts to the funeral of Pompeo. Cleopatra has disguised herself as a made-up woman named Lydia. Lydia approaches Cesare and woefully tells him how it is her birthright to be the sole ruler of Egypt, but it was stolen by Ptolemeo. Giulio Cesare takes a look at Lydia and immediately falls in love with her, falls for everything she is saying, and agrees to help her. Next, we move to Cordinelli and Sesto, who are in complete despair at this funeral, and they talk about how they can kill Ptolemeo. Cleopatra, still disguised as Lydia, overhears them plotting and offers her services to help in any way she can. After all, an enemy of Ptolemeo is a friend of Cleopatra's. Atto Primo ends with the long-awaited meeting between Cesare and Ptolemeo. 
they try and see if they can come to some sort of understanding so that there's not so much tension between the two of them, and eventually they do. Then Cordelia and her son Sesto approach Ptolemeo and question his actions. Ptolemeo looks at Cordelia and is smitten by her beauty. Cordelia is not impressed. And while this is happening, out of nowhere, Sesto pulls out his sword and challenges Ptolemeo to combat. He must not remember that Ptolemeo is in fact king of Egypt. They are in his area. Ptolemeo not only says, I'm not going to combat you, but you and your mother are going to prison. When this is happening, Aquila comes in overhears that Cordelia and Sesto are going to go to prison, approaches Cornelia and says, I can get you out of prison, but only if you become my wife. She is not impressed at all. I mean, it's quite obvious because he was the one who delivered her husband's head on a platter. He is disappointed and they are both sent to prison. The end of act one brings us to this duet, Son Nata a Lagrimar, which translates to, I was born to weep. And this happens when Cordelia and her son Sesto realize they are going to be imprisoned. Ato secondo. Act two opens up to a party thrown by Cleopatra. Cleopatra attends her own event dressed as her alter ego, Lydia. Lydia's goal is to reel in Cesare even more by seducing him. And this is when her very famous aria, Vadoro Pupile, is sung. Giulio Cesare falls head over heels for her all over again and likes what he hears. Nireno, Cleopatra's servant, then approaches Cesare and says, Hey, Lydia actually really likes you back, and if you want, she has invited you to meet her up in her room later after the festivities. He's excited and, of course, wants to go and meet Cleopatra later that night. The next scene shifts to Ptolemeo's prison, where Cordelia and her son Sesto are being held. Aquila comes in and approaches Cordelia for the second time, asking her to be his wife. She says, no, I don't want you, and tells him to leave. Then shortly after, Ptolemeo comes in, who is in love with Cordelia, and reapproaches her and asks her if she will be with him. She says, no, you disgust me, get out of my sight. Ptolemeo is not happy. With everything going on with poor Cordelia and Sestro, her husband has died, her son's father has died, and they are in a prison with no future in sight. She becomes extremely depressed and contemplates suicide. Luckily for her, Sestro comes in and has escaped his cell with the help of Nireno and saves his mom. But unfortunately, shortly after that, Nireno delivers some terrible news that Ptolemeo, who is extremely angry that he's been rejected by Cordelia, has ordered Cordelia to become his mistress and she must meet him up in his room later that evening. Well, the three of them are trying to figure out what to do, and so they plot how they can kill Ptolemeo. And the plan is to sneak Sesto into the room when Ptolemeo is trying to have his way with Cordelia so that Sesto can kill Ptolemeo when he is vulnerable. Ato Secondo ends in Cleopatra's room, where she is waiting for Giulio Cesare. Before anything can happen between the two of them, Curio, who is Cesare's general, interrupts them to tell Cesare that Ptolemeo has sent an army to Cesare's palace to attack. Cleopatra is stricken by this news and is very worried and tells Cesare that he should flee. Giulio Cesare does not take this into consideration, but instead pledges to fight for his palace. Ato terzo. 
Act three is the battle act. But before we get into the battle, we start in Ptolemeo's room, where he is waiting for Cornelia. Before he can have his way with her, Sesto appears out of nowhere, part of the plan, and tries to kill Ptolemeo, but is reprimanded by Aquila. Aquila then announces to Ptolemeo that Cesare learned that Ptolemeo's troops were on their way to Cesare's palace and has thrown himself out of a window in an attempt to escape all of the chaos. So they believe Cesare is dead. Meanwhile, Cleopatra gets together some troops and heads over to Cesare's palace, not knowing Cesare is not there. Ptolemeo then gathers his troops in order to go after Cleopatra, attack her, and then join his troops who are on their way to Cesare's palace. But before he goes, Aquila approaches him and says, Hey, I finished my end of the deal. Cesare is dead. Now I want Cordinalia. Well, Ptolemeo rejects everything he says and replies, You will not have Cordinalia. In fact, she is mine. This upsets Aquila, and he vows to switch sides and become the friend of Cleopatra. Next is the battle scene, where Ptolemeo is victorious and has captured his sister Cleopatra. We then learn that Cesare is not dead, but was washed away at sea and then spit out on a shore or a land and is wounded. Nearby, Aquila, the general to Ptolemeo, who has switched allegiances, is badly wounded, and he is approached by Sesto and Nireno, Cleopatra's servant, and they see how badly wounded he is. And in that moment, Sesto is given great power. He is given the authority to be the commander of the troops, the troops of Ptolemeo. Cesare overhears this new power that Sesto has been given, and either requests or just steals that authority away from him. Aquila passes away and we are left knowing that Sesto is very angry that he has just lost his authority. The next scene shifts to Ptolemeo's prison where Cleopatra is being held. She is very, very depressed and tries to commit suicide. But Cesare comes in and rescues her, and she is happy. Meanwhile, Ptolemeo is relaxed. He believes Cesare is dead, his palace has no power, his sister is in his own prison, everything is good. While he's having this moment of relief and happiness and a moment full of pride, Sesto comes in uses this opportunity and kills him. The opera ends announcing the battle has been won and Cleopatra is crowned the sole queen of Egypt. She has also partnered with the Roman Empire. The two lovers are happily together and all is well. Now let's talk about this duet, which is sung by the characters Cordinalia and Sesto. In this performance, Natalie Stutzman is singing the role of Cordinalia and Philippe Jarowski is singing the role of Sestro. This is a mother and son duet. Now I love the very beginning of this duet and I'm not sure if this is part of the original or another version, but the scores that I have seen do not have this intro. So I'm curious where this comes from. In the very beginning, they are saying, my piu sperar potro, which means never again hope I will be able. Potro is the future. Never again will I be able to hope. <laughs>
And I think what was very interesting in this beginning were two things. First off, the difference between their U vowels. Now, I believe both of them are from France. Don't quote me on that. The difference between their U vowels, I think, has a lot to do with their voice types. So if you look at Miss Natalie, her U vowels are very rounded. You can see her lips come out a bit more and it's more true to an U vowel. For Jahuski, in his upper register, he doesn't keep his lips as rounded as Miss Natalie. And that, of course, has to do with the fact that he is singing a soprano role, but as a male. And so what, let's say for me in my register as a soprano, what would be just my mid range, which he is singing, is his upper range. And so when I take that into context, if that were my upper range, the higher I go, the more difficult it is to maintain an U vowel. It's just so much easier to sing on an open A ah or even higher an A. Ah. And you can kind of see that happening just a little bit, but not too much. He doesn't have a true open A ah vowel, but it's more like this, where he's singing an U through a quarter of a smile. His lips are somewhat rounded, but not nearly as much as Miss Natalie's. <laughs> If you're listening very closely, you can hear the difference between Natalie's U and Jahuski's U. The good thing about this is they blend and sound incredibly well, despite them not having, let's say, the exact vowel. They're both in different difficulties of their register, and one vowel may be easier for the other one to sing through, which that, in instances, just takes over this idea of the true vowel. Second thing that I loved about this intro, and actually it happens again later on, is how they are able to begin their trills at the exact same time and how they are able to get off of a note at the exact same time. That is so, <laughs> so, 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 so hard. And what's even more impressive, they weren't even looking at each other during these moments of extreme difficulty where they need to be coordinated. I thought that was so, so cool to witness. God, I love Baroque music. This idea of street tone. I think it is a fascinating topic. I wish it was talked about so much more, especially in the classical space. What it does for me is it adds to this idea of tension and resolution. When you do get that vibrato from the singer, it's not often and it's usually not crazy strong. That's usually reserved for later eras in classical music. This is so beautiful to me because I, I hear both of them using straight tone in, in equal amounts. <laughs> that all of that is 
really equal, which makes the entire piece sound cohesive. I don't know if that was discussed prior. I don't even know what their analytical process is like. I don't know if they go note by note and say, hey, when we're singing together, we're both singing straight tone on all of these notes. We bring vibrato on this note at this beat. I have no idea. That would be very, very interesting to learn. One thing that I love about the intro of both solos is the first two notes, which is an interval of a sixth on both times. Miss Natalie comes in on a minor sixth and it is on the notes B flat and G flat. Ah, such a beautiful sound. Now when Jahuski, who plays Sesto comes in, he comes in and sings on a major six. So earlier it was a minor six by Natalie Cordinalia. Now it's a major six by Sesto. So now, ah, I thought that was just so genius. I know they didn't write it, but the execution was just so great. And if you don't know, the six is my favorite interval. Last thing to point out is the dynamic choices, which plays such a huge part in music overall, between instrumentalists and between singers. And when you're duetting with someone else, those dynamic choices are so powerful because it shows the audience just how much thought you put into it without them even really thinking that far. For example, there's a moment where they both sing a sempre, ah, always and on sempre on sam the first syllable of sempre they start out pretty strong and then they back off at the same time before landing on pre <laughs> that decision making and execution <laughs> is wildly difficult. And this is the time, another time where they're not even looking at each other. They just know exactly when to be mezzo forte and exactly when to back off and exactly when and how to land. You all? <laughs> all of the dynamic choices, all of the different ways to say ah. I mean, how many times is the word ah said in this duet? Probably over a dozen times. <laughs> Aren't you gonna say that the same way every single time? No, that is so boring and that has no meaning. If you hear the way, especially in Natalie, there is one time where she started with so much air. <sighs> oh, it just made that awe so much 
more gut-wrenching. Um, I think all of those choices really make this performance so enjoyable. And I understand, looking at this scroll bar, why the majority of this video is the most replayed. If you liked all that you saw, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and comment down below what piece by your favorite classical composer you would like me to do a performance analysis on next. Lastly, make sure to check out the description box for ways you can keep in touch with me, get access to exclusive perks, check out the Soprano Notes blog, which has tons of information on the classical genre, and or take a lesson with me. I hope you have a good day and I'll see you soon. Bye!